Um, today we should be both uh, happy and sad. Uh, we should be sad because uh, this is the last quantum mechanics lecture. Uh, you should be happy because A, you've gotten rid of me, and B, uh, the next subject uh, with Year 11, absolutely superb. Um, absolute theoretical physics genius, Year 11. Very, very good. And statistical physics is one of the most beautiful and deep subjects in all physics. There's quite a lot of quantum mechanics, by the way, in statistical physics as well. Today we're going to conclude our discussions on the hydrogen atom, uh, asking the question, what does the Schrodinger equation predict for the energy levels of the hydrogen atom? Secondly, um, we'll have an ending and a beginning. The ending and the beginning being at the end of the course, uh, but also to have an overview of uh, all the stuff that we've covered in the course and some indication of uh, the thousand million directions in which this course can lead. But let's begin by concluding our discussions on the hydrogen atom. So we're considering the Schrodinger equation, the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Instead of an arbitrary time-dependent potential, we had uh, a rotation symmetric potential that just depends on radial distance little r from a particular point. And for, for the Coulomb field that surrounds a single point charge, for the Coulomb field that surrounds um, the nucleus of a single point charge, we have the one on r potential, which we wrote down in the last class. Um, minus e squared, where e is the magnitude of the charge on the electron. Uh, epsilon naught is this permittivity of free space. And r is the radial distance from the nucleus to a given point. So we have uh, this potential. We want to solve the Schrodinger equation in the presence of this rotationally symmetric time independent potential. And we had a fairly tortured and long chain of logic that you can write the wave function, uh, the time dependent wave function as a function of position and time. Uh, and I write, won't write down the explicit time dependence. Uh, you can write it in terms of a spatial wave function, which depends only on position um, uh, and uh, the usual harmonic time factor. So when you do, when you do that, your uh, problem for the wave function capital psi that obeys the time dependent Schrodinger equation then becomes a problem for determining the, little wave, the wave function little psi, the spatial wave function, which is a function of position, as opposed to big psi, which is a function of position and time. We then uh, went a step further. We expressed wave functions psi as a function of position and time. Or if we're in polar coordinates, these spatial wave functions would be a function of r theta and phi. We wrote them in terms of uh, a radial wave function, little r, with some subscripts, and then the spherical harmonics. We learned that the, the, the necessary subscripts here were e and l. So if you tell me what big R is, the so-called radial wave function, then uh, I'll tell you what uh, little psi is. And if you tell me what little psi is, I'll tell you what big psi is. So instead of having the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for the wave function big psi, uh, or instead of having the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the wave function little psi, we instead had the radial wave equation for the radial wave function uh, big R. We then made a substitution that the so-called scaled radial wave function little u was uh, little r times the radial wave function. So we then had an equation for the scaled radial wave function little u. And if you know what little u is, you can shove it into this to get big R. If you know what big R is, you can put it into this to get uh, little psi and so on. Uh, the arbitrary psi would be a, um, a superposition of these things. Now there's going to be one more element in this chain. We need one and only one more element uh, in this uh, five uh, member chain in order to do what we want in this section, which is to work out the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. And where we ended uh, the last class was the equation uh, for the scaled radial wave function. This is the form that the Schrodinger equation takes for the scaled radial wave function little u, and that was equation 309, which I'll rewrite here. So d squared d 
50 rho squared. And rho, uh, I'll remind you, is a scaled distance. So rho is proportional to radial distance r with a constant of proportionality, um, mass of the electron. Uh, there's an 8 here. There's the energy, but the energy is negative, so I have a negative energy, which is going to be positive. It makes what's under the square root positive. So this is our scaled radial distance r, r now becomes rho, a scaled distance. We also have this quantity lambda, which is not the wavelength. Magnitude of the charge on the electron squared. Permittivity of free space uh, appears here. H-bar. Uh, this is quantum mechanics after all. Mass of the electron. And the energy. Again, since it's negative, um, uh, putting that negative sign makes what's under the square root uh, positive. So with this definition for scaled radial distance and this um, parameter lambda, which depends on the energy, our Schrodinger equation for the scaled radial wave function took this form. So L is the orbital angular momentum quantum number. We're ignoring spin here. Lambda is that free variable that I mentioned earlier. We have a quarter and then the U, which is now a function of scaled radial distance rho. And all this equals naught. So this is the equation that we need to solve. Now again, when in, for example, a mathematics setting, you meet a differential equation you haven't solved before, one of the first things you, you, that you'll do, or could do, is to consider the, a power series solution. That's not going to be any good here, for exactly the same reason it wasn't good when we were considering, considering the uh, Schrodinger equation. You know, this is an atom, right? And you've got a point uh, which, is where the, uh, which is creating the potential that's holding the atom in. You know that the wave function is going to have to decay to infinity. The wave function is going to have to be naught at infinity. Because if you've got an atom here, then you don't have any electrons at the edge of the universe due to that atom. So you want the wave function, irrespective of whatever fancy mathematics you're pulling, you want the wave function, and hence capital R and hence little u, to decay to infinity. So whatever u looks like, it better uh, decay to zero at infinity. Now you give me any polynomial, OK, it's a function of radial distance r or scaled radial distance rho. Do you give me any polynomial? I don't know, 2 plus rho plus 5 rho squared plus 0 0.001 rho cubed, and then push right up to infinity. Your polynomial, I guarantee you, will blow up, right? So polynomials are very, very bad at going smoothly to infinity. So that's why we're not even going to bother just trying to uh, have a polynomial solution to this because we know on physical grounds that this thing uh, must decay smoothly to zero, and no polynomial is going to cut it, or more precisely, no finite order polynomial is going to cut it. So we have to pull tricks similar to those that we pulled when we were studying the um, uh, simple harmonic oscillator. From the perspective of the Schrodinger equation, we need to begin uh, with an understanding of how the solution, uh, in this case for the scaled radial wave function u, considered as a function of the scaled radial distance rho, we need to understand better how it decays to infinity. So let's ask the question, how does the equation decay when rho is large, when you're very far from the origin, when you're trying to get to the edges of the universe? Well, these the second and third terms are going to switch off if rho is large. And so if rho is large, the d squared u d rho squared will stay, the minus a quarter will stay, but these will become arbitrarily small, the second and the third terms. So let's throw those second and third terms away and say that this is the asymptotic form of the equation. Yep, you can speak of the asymptotic form of a function. You can also speak of the limiting form or the asymptotic form of the equation. Only the first uh, and final terms in the differential equation survive if uh, rho tends to infinity. And this is a simpler equation. And being a simpler equation, you can solve this equation. And what you get is equation 311, that the scaled uh, radial wave function. Uh, now, I've written equals in the notes, but let me use a better mathematical symbol. This means is asymptotically equal to. It also uh, equivalently means uh, tends towards. Yep, so this object uh, tends towards uh, e to the plus or minus rho on 2. 
this is the solution or the pair of solutions to this equation. And so this is telling us that as uh, rho becomes infinite, this is telling us how the wave function uh, behaves. Now, exponential blow up is unacceptable. We don't want uh, the electron to have infinite um, uh, wave function at the edges of the universe. We're going to reject the uh, plus solution as absurd and unphysical. We'll keep the negative solution. So this is good. So we know how the wave function behaves uh, asymptotically. I also want you to recall exercise 68. Um, here we have the behaviour of the wave function for large rho. In exercise 68, um, the heat, this means that rho tends to zero from above. I want rho to be always strictly positive, but it's becoming arbitrarily small. In exercise 68, we learned about the asymptotic behaviour of this, not for large rho, but for small rho. And there we learned that this behaved as r to, uh, rho to the L plus 1. Sorry, it, we had r to the L plus 1 for that exercise, but since rho and r are proportional, this now becomes a rho to the L plus 1, exercise 68. So we now know how this uh, wave function, scaled radial wave function more precisely, should behave for both small uh, and large rho. And so this lets us write down a beast of an equation, which is equation 312 in your notes. This is now the form of the solution uh, that we need for our problem. So I don't want the wave function for large rho and for small rho. I want it for arbitrary rho. Yep, I want it for arbitrary rho. So let me write down uh, the answer, and then I'll justify it. I'll just multiply this one by the physically acceptable form of the next term. And then I'll multiply it by a finite order polynomial. Yep, so I want to have some coefficients, g subscript k, some powers, rho of k. Uh, I'm going to demand that g naught be non-zero. And even though I'm formally putting an infinity here, um, I want uh, this series to truncate. I want the g's to truncate uh, at some point. Because if um, I allow this series to run off to infinity, then my asymptotic behaviour um, will be spoiled. This decays to naught. These things blow up when rho becomes large. A finite order polynomial blowing up is always killed by exponential decay, something that you can prove to yourself. Uh, but I don't like this infinity sign because it spoils uh, the desired asymptotic behaviour of the u. Let me get rid of that plus because I don't like it. So it's just a minus. So with Ignoring the internal contradiction of this infinite limit, um, it should be finite, uh, this is going to have the properties I want. Why? Well, when rho is bugger all, when rho is essentially zero, this will be g naught plus g1 rho plus g2 rho squared, etc. If rho is basically naught, this will just become a constant, which is g naught. If rho is naught, this is one. So if rho is naught, the function is going to tend to rho to the L plus 1, exactly as we wanted. On the other hand, if rho is infinitely large, that'll be big. Now, this is g naught plus g1k plus g2k squared, etc., and, and truncates at some point. I don't know, gn rho to the n. Then for big rho, it's only the last term that lives, the gn rho to the n. So this behaves as one, some power of rho, as does this. It's finite, and that's killed off by this object. So this gives the correct asymptotic behaviour for small rho, this gives the correct asymptotic behaviour for large rho, and this polynomial here is just going to modify that asymptotic behaviour so that the whole function uh, obeys the equation we want it to, which is uh, this one here. One more thing. We've introduced now the fifth member of our hierarchy. Yep. You give me the wave function capital Psi. Um, I'm going to break it down and end up with the wave function little psi. So let's actually go the opposite way. You give me this set of numbers, gk, this set of coefficients, which are now the unknowns, by the way. You give me that set of little gks, and I'll tell you what u is. So if you tell me the set of coefficients gk, I'll tell you what u is. But if you tell me what little u is, then I'll tell you what big R is. There it is. If you tell me what big R is, then I'll multiply by these known functions of spherical harmonics to get the, the time independent wave function psi, uh, and, and similarly I can then construct the wave function big psi using this. So you have this uh, chain of logic. 
So if I wanted the wave functions, uh, I'd solve for these g's, calculate hence the little u, go up the chain and ultimately have the wave functions psi for the hydrogen atom. Now that's fun, but uh, tedious. If I had three extra classes, I'd do it in full detail. Instead, we're just going to get the energy levels, as I've said before. So we want the energy levels. And this, at the moment, is boiling down to the question of what these gk's are. Now, we need an equation, right? If you're talking about big psi, that's going to be um, uh, governed by some equation, which is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. You go one link down the chain to little psi, and you've got the time-independent Schrodinger equation. You go one link, link down the chain again, you've got big R. That's going to be the radial wave equation. Go one link down further, you've got the scaled radial wave equation uh, for little u. Go one link further down and we want uh, an equation for gk. The gk is going to be a bunch of, of numbers, yeah? Uh, and we need to determine the equation that, um, that governs that bunch of numbers. So let's do it. So what you've got to do is some... Um, uh, uh, you, you're going to have some um, fun writing some big mathematical expressions when you do the associated exercises. Because what you need to do is to take this object here and substitute it into here and see what happens, right? And there's going to be several tricks that you need regarding substituting these, um, uh, I'd call these envelopes, I'd call this a power series, so I'd call this an enveloped power series. There are going to be several tricks that you need to learn regarding the substitution of enveloped power series into differential equations. There's no substitute for um, doing the associated exercises, uh, making the mistakes as I did when I was in your shoes until you learn uh, um, how to do it. But the essence is, uh, throw this into this, um, uh, use every trick that you know, uh, oh, sorry, many of the tricks that you know regarding sums, and what you'll end up with will be equation 314. So sum from, from k equals naught to infinity, this infinity is this infinity, and I'm still viewing this infinity with suspicion for reasons that I've I explained earlier. And then you get some uh, coefficient, which is a big one, as this, not big enough. Uh, it's a big coefficient, yep, times rho to the k, and that all equals naught. Now before I even fill in uh, what's inside this brace, this coefficient, I know that it must vanish, and I can give two arguments for this. Argument number one, this is a linear combination of powers of k, of, of rho, sorry. And the set of powers of rho, uh, I mean, this is just a Taylor series, right? This is a Taylor series, something times rho to the naught, plus something times rho to the one, plus something times um, rho squared, and so on. This is a Taylor series. This is a Taylor series for zero, right? And if I ask you, what are the Taylor series coefficients of zero? The answer is simple, zero. 0 equals 0 plus 0 rho plus 0 rho squared plus 0 rho cubed, etc. Um, each of these coefficients must be naught. And we know that uh, just looking at this shell of an equation. Alternatively, you could give a second argument for why, uh, a second albeit related argument for why uh, what's in the braces must vanish. This uh, set of powers of rho, with k being naught, 1, 2, etc., is a line linearly independent set. Uh, and the left side of this equation is uh, a weighted superposition or uh, of the elements of that linearly independent set. It's a linear combination of elements of that linearly independent set. This vanishes, uh, and you know that a linear combination of elements of a linearly independent set will vanish if and only if each coefficient vanishes. Hence, what's in the braces is naught. Irrespective of the argument that you use, what's in the braces is naught. Now, when you do your wizardry of putting this into um, uh, into the scaled radial wave equation, uh, you'll get the following. And by the way, a, a variant to this kind of question is on the second assignment, which is now up, up, on, up on Moodle. So gk plus 1 uh, is multiplied by the coefficient in square brackets. Uh, I still didn't leave enough space. and gk is multiplied by this coefficient. So everything in braces must vanish. So you say, okay, everything in braces must vanish. Something times gk plus one, 
plus something times gk must vanish. Uh, and just writing that equation out, something times gk plus 1 plus something times gk must vanish. Uh, if you then solve that uh, equation trivially for gk plus 1, you get the following. Now, if you're having a bit of a feeling of, I've seen this before, I've seen this kind of trick before, uh, you have when we were studying the hydrogen, the um, uh, simple harmonic oscillator. But that makes a good point. The first time you see uh, a new tool, a new mathematical tool, for example, in the context of this course, it's, it's unfamiliar, it's bizarre. But the 15th time you see it, uh, then you start to say to yourself, this is a familiar element of my toolkit. This is like my hammer or my screwdriver, yeah? Um, uh, ma mathematical physicists such as me aren't that imaginative that there's certain tools that we use again and again. Uh, this idea is one of them. Uh, the idea of superposing uh, um, sets of basis functions to synthesise other functions is another example. Whether you're adding up plane waves to make a wave function, whether you're adding up plane, wa adding up plane waves to make a wave function, adding up powers of x to make a, a Taylor series, adding up um, powers of e to the imx to make a Fourier series, uh, adding up powers of 10 to make a base 10 number, uh, in all those examples, um, adding up bricks to make a brick wall, in all of those examples you're uh, having superpositions, linear superpositions of objects to create more complex objects. And that's on the one hand a very um, bland statement, but Fourier series, Taylor series, Bessel series, Catherine series, crazy series number x, 15 bizarre series you've never heard of, they're all just superpositions of somebody's polynomials or somebody's functions to give somebody's decomposition. Um, so this idea of superposition is important. I just want to make the point that there's many tools of theoretical physics that are used again and again and again, not just within the context of this course but more broadly. And we'll touch again on that soon. But I'm babbling, let's get back to this. Uh, what's in braces vanishes. Solve the resulting equation for gk plus one and you get the following. So this has a name, it's called a recursion relation. You've heard that term from me before. And this is um, uh, another opportunity to mention frogs, right? Um, pick a number, any number, as long as it's non-zero. And to make your life easy, make it real and positive. That G naught is whatever it is, whatever you picked it to be. This is a recipe, a recursion relation, which takes you from, tells you if you give me a particular GK, I'll tell you what GK plus one is. So you've picked G naught out of the air. The recursion relation gives you G1. G1 gives you G2. We're applying this thing recursively. That's why it's called a recursion relation. Um, G2 becomes G3 and so on. And you generate uh, all of the members of the set of the GKs. So you know what this thing is. Then you can just go up the chain, right? Little, the set of G's gives you the little U's. The little U's gives you the big R's. Big R gives you lowercase psi. Lowercase psi gives you big psi. Now there's one degree piece of arbitrariness here, which is this um, initial choice. If you then just say, I want my wave function to be normalised, then that'll fix um, uh, the magnitude of G naught. And that's it. You, you could write this as magnitude of G naught times some phase factor, but who cares about the phase factor? Pointless, get rid of it. Um, the point is, normalisation will determine the magnitude of this object, and you've solved for the wave functions of the hydrogen atom. But to do that in detail, uh, to work out all the g's, and hence go up the ladder and construct the wave functions, the hydrogen wave functions psi, uh, takes about three lectures uh, and about, uh, um, I don't know, 50 or 60 pages of, of, of calculation. Uh, absolutely you could do it, but uh, I'm not going to do it. If you pick up any um, third year level quantum mechanics book, they'll go through it in, in full detail. Uh, my favourite book, by the way, is, which has influenced this course more than any other, is by um, Branston and Joa Chain, and it's called uh, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. Uh, it will give you the full hydrogen wave functions. If you want to see uh, hydrogen wave functions in even more detail, pick up a book on quantum chemistry, because this isn't just about physics. Hydrogen wave functions uh, are about uh, 
are also the first point at which you start to, um, you want to study chemistry from the perspective of quantum physics, you start solving Schrodinger equations for water molecules, where you begin is the, is the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen molecule. There's a book by Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, uh, Levine called Quantum Chemistry, which um, the chemists are better than the physicists at, 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 at um, discussing wave functions for hydrogen atoms and beyond. Anyway, uh, this is what we could do if we wanted to get the wave functions, but we won't. We're just going to stop at the point where we get the energies uh, of the hydrogen atom. You'd think after 20 lectures I'd get that right. There you go. And now my scepticism regarding the infinity sign here uh, comes back to, to, to haunt us. Although the resolution of this conundrum will give us the answer to the problem. If I take the expression for gk plus 1 equals something times gk and rewrite as uh, gk plus 1 over gk, and then I force k to be infinite, what you'll find is that this thing tends uh, to 1 on k, which looks all right. Again, we've seen this before. You might think, well, the, the GKs, the coefficients, are converging to naught, as they must, um, or more precisely, um, the ratio of successive coefficients becomes arbitrarily small, which is a necessary condition. Uh, so, sorry, this ratio of coefficients is becoming arbitrarily small. It looks good, but it doesn't. Uh, this ratio is not going to um, naught fast enough, even though this is going to naught for large k, it's not going to naught fast enough, this uh, series if allowed to continue indefinitely, again, we're looking at this infinity, the series, if allowed to continue indefinitely, will blow up. And you've proven how it blows up in exercise R37, that this, if allowed to go on indefinitely, implies a blow up uh, with the scaled radial wave function uh, blowing up. Uh, it doesn't just blow up as a polynomial, rho to the 2p, but there's also an e to the row squared. So this is a, a shockingly bad blow up. It's terrible. Um, but again, this is that internal inconsistency I mentioned earlier. Uh, the solution is to n stop this series. I mean, basically, the polynomial is going to win if you have infinitely many terms. Um, this term is going gonna, is gonna to blow up. And that's terrible. So we can avoid this blow up, uh, as we've done before, by making the series stop at some point. So if you have g0 um, implying g1, implying g2, etc. By the way, um, these are frogs, right? Recursion relation is like a frog going from g0 to g1 to g2, etc. But if we uh, truncate at some point, for example, there's some particular um, g, let's call it g subscript capital M, and suppose that for that particular g, um, uh, I suppose that that particular g, which we're calling uh, g subscript N, Sorry, one error. Um, suppose that that's the last non-zero value. Suppose that every subsequent g is naught. So if the next g is naught, then we look at our recursion relation, which says that gk plus 1 is something times gk. Well, if one of the g's is naught, then every subsequent g will be naught. If gn is naught, then gn plus 1 will be naught times something. So every subsequent one will be naught. Yep. So what we're doing here is setting um, gn plus 1 to naught. How can we do that? Well, we just look at our recursion relation, uh, gk plus 1. Let me write it out again, uh, our recursion relation, l plus 1 plus k minus lambda. And then all the stuff on the bottom. Yep times gk. Now I'm going to choose a particular value of k that we're calling uh, capital M. And this is going to, uh, I'm going to demand that this series, uh, that the gn plus 1 vanish. And that will vanish if this vanishes. So I want this to be naught. Yep. Otherwise, I get something unphysical. By the way, I've just quantized the system, Yep. as we'll see. 
so that must vanish. I've just quantized the system, by the way, because lambda is a function of energy. Yep, lambda is a function of energy here. So if, if there's only, if lambda is constrained by this equation and lambda is a function of the energy, then uh, the energies are quantized. Now L is not 1, 2, etc. Um, 1 is 1. Uh, K is not 1, 2, etc. So if you add um, the num a number L, which is not 1, 2, etc., to 1, to not 1, 2, etc., then uh, what you'll get is an integer n, little n, uh, which is 1, 2, 3, etc. We give this the name the principal quantum number. It's a quantum number because it's a number that governs the energy, because the energy is hiding in here. Uh, it's called the principal quantum number because it's the main quantum number. In fact, it's the only quantum number here. By the way, m and l have dropped out. Interesting. m and l have dropped out. Uh, you have the equation now that n equals lambda. n minus lambda is naught, so n uh, equals lambda. But lambda is e squared, etc. Yep. So n is not 1, 2, etc. So all of our Schrodinger equations boil down to this. But this is what we want. This is an expression for the energy. Because if you take this object here and substitute for lambda uh, and then solve for the energies, you'll get equation 318, which is what we wanted. The energy levels of the hydrogen atom. They're going to depend on the, on the principal quantum number n. And as we write this, we feel good because we've got a formula. But then a bad feeling sense, tends to come to us because we've seen this formula before. Uh, we've seen this formula before in studying the Bohr theory. Uh, we've seen this before in studying the Bohr theory. In fact, it's exactly the same formula as you get from the Bohr theory. So why the hell did we go through all this um, has hassle uh, when you could have solved it with the Bohr theory? Good question. Um, the answer is the following. You've heard of the Bohr theory of the hydrogen atom, but you will never have heard of the Bohr theory of the helium atom, or the Bohr theory of the um, uh, um, uranium atom, or the Bohr theory of the water molecule, uh, or the Bohr theory of, of um, uh, electrons in the metal, or the Bohr theory of a quantum dot, or the Bohr theory of a quantum ring, or the Bohr theory of a quantum dot, uh, etc. And that's because the Bohr theory uh, is very, very difficult to uh, extend beyond uh, studying the hydrogen atom. The Schrodinger theory, uh, unlike the Bohr theory, can be applied to helium atoms, uh, to copper crystals, um, to quantum dots, to quantum rings, uh, to quantum chains. Uh, to a vast variety of, of quantum systems, uh, to water molecules, to, um, uh, to helium atoms and so on. So it's almost no exaggeration to say that the Schrodinger equation has infinitely more applicability than the Bohr theory. And so even though the Bohr theory has given us uh, the energy levels of the hydrogen atom that the Schrodinger theory does, um, the Schrodinger theory is much more broadly applicable. Another point. You get this formula, right, and you measure your spectral lines of your hydrogen atom and they fit pretty well. But then a couple of decades pass and your ability to measure spectral lines, uh, the frequencies of spectral lines, improves. Uh, this theory actually gives you the wrong answer. It's close, but it's not quite right. And what you can do is you can modify the Schrodinger equation. You, you can add extra terms, for example, which take spin into account, uh, terms which take spin into account and you'll find that this formula gets modified. It'll have some extra bit added to it. That's readily calculable uh, from the context of the Schrodinger theory, and it's more or less impossible to calculate from the perspective of the Bohr theory. So if you want ultra-high precision spectroscopy of a hydrogen atom, uh, you'll need the Schrodinger theory with a modified uh, Schrodinger equation, which takes spin into account, for example, um, um, in order to get the right answers. Schrodinger theory is infinitely more applicable uh, than Bohr theory. Now this takes us on to um, our final section, just trying to uh, look beyond uh, this course. So this is the ending and the beginning. 
So in many respects, this course is an enabler. And what I mean by that is that many of what I would call bread and butter tools of theoretical physics are developed in this course. Uh, um, tools that get applied again and again and again, uh, not just within quantum mechanics, but more broadly within, within theoretical physics. Uh, and the only way to get familiar with uh, these tools is through repeated um, use and seeing them in a number of contexts. Again, the first and the second time you see them, they're bizarre and unfamiliar, but the 15th time you see them, you begin to realise that, that they're, that they're um, are powerful uh, tools uh, which can be applied in many new contexts. Uh, there are also many future courses that build on this. Uh, quantum mechanics is kind of important. Uh, it's used again and again. You'll, uh, your understanding of this stuff uh, in the whole course will be deepened by seeing it applied in our uh, subsequent courses, one of which is the statistical mechanics course that follows this one. Um, our quantum mechanics uh, appears in so many, many areas of physics. Uh, also, there's, some, there's quite a few classical areas of physics which draw on tools that you can learn and develop in the co context of, of quantum mechanics. So an overarching big picture of, 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 um, of this course, I'm going to go over the course in, in very, very broad brush um, manner. Um, uh, I want you to understand a little more about the myriad ways in which these various tools can be, can be used. Now it seems like such a long time ago when we were talking about uh, lemon trees and the, the idea, the metaphor of the lemon tree at the beginning of the first class was um, intended to provoke the idea that um, uh, quantum mechanics uh, sh should be weird, that there's no reason why our everyday intuition um, should extrapolate down correctly to masses, lengths and times that are vastly smaller than masses, lengths and times that we can directly uh, app apprehend. And I spoke of the dangers of extrapolation and indeed much of physics is about uh, revising, correctly revising, through the light of scientific inquiry, um, correctly uh, revising our, our screwed up intuition, right? So quantum mechanics revises the screwed up intuition that we have when we think classically. Uh, relativistic mechanics revises our screwed up intuition. Um, our intuition is, is terrible. Um, our intuition is based on the implicit and wrong assumption that the speed of light is infinite. We've got very, very well-defined intuition for the fact that the speed of sound is finite. We're happy to see that the, the lightning strike and then hear it a little bit later. We're happy to see the cricketer hit the ball uh, and then uh, he, he, um, uh, and then hear the ball being struck a little later. We have good intuition for the, for the non-infinite nature of the speed of sound, terrible intuition for the non-infinite nature of the speed of light. And so special relativity um, is another example where uh, everyday common sense can't be extrapolated uh, and our, our physical understanding of the world through experiment and through mathematical physics uh, leads to relativity, rewriting our intuition to be consistent with um, uh, the way the world actually behaves. Um, I've given the examples of quantum mechanics, special relativity, I could also mention uh, general relativity, superfluidity, uh, superconductivity, etc. Now these things are cool and bizarre and abstract, but sometimes they can have uh, everyday uh, applications. So for example, uh, the theory of quantum physics is needed to make uh, your computers work, the chips in your computers work. While the chips in your computers and your mobile phones are not quantum computers, quantum mechanics is a supporting technology, and in that sense, understanding quantum mechanics um, from an abstract perspective uh, led to something very practical, such as a mobile phone. Another example, uh, Schwarzschild, um, or Sch Schwarzschild, um, fight fighting in the trenches of World War I, um, gave a solution of Einstein's field equations for a black hole that describes uh, the curvature of space-time around a, a static, spherically symmetric body. It also describes the curvature of space-time that surrounds the Earth, right? Um, you say, well, big deal, you know, satellites such as uh, occur in our global positioning system uh, don't travel anywhere near the speed of light. That's true, but uh, you need ultra high precision timing in order to get your global positioning system to work. If you don't take into account uh, the warping of space time due to the Schwarzschild solution for black holes, except applied to the Earth, which is approximately stationary spherical mass for the purposes of the warping of space time around the Earth, unless you take that general relativity result into account, your global positioning system doesn't work. So that's an example of a profound link between theoretical physics, which is um, abstract and applied to something very distant, such as black holes. Um, and then straight away you get this huge leap to everyday experience. Every time you press the locate button on Facebook with your mobile phone, uh, the Einstein field equations are being solved to get the timing right, uh, to get your positioning right so you can do that Facebook post. 
Um, so that connection, those profound connections between, um, b between uh, very, very abstract applications, which I love, and also very, very applied applications, which I love equally, um, is kind of cool. I kept adding up plane waves, um, and some of you would have said this is the fifth time, particularly those doing certain double degree engineering courses would have said, I'm sick of seeing bloody Fourier series, I'm seeing them again and again and again, that's because they're important. Um, uh, adding up plane waves uh, to synthesise arbitrary disturbances, and the opposite is, uh, is, our is decomposition. This idea of Fourier transform pairs is kind of important, kind of cuts through many, many areas of physics, engineering and mathematics. And plane waves aren't the only complete set that you can add up. We added up eigenfunctions to give eigenfunction expansions. We added up plane waves to get plane wave expansions. We added up uh, um, powers of rho to give uh, Taylor expansions. Um, in the first assignment, you added up signs and causes to give Fourier expansions. This idea of orthogonal function expansions, uh, again, is kind of important. Again, you see it, uh, this kind of thing, again and again. And I invite you to have a look um, you know, mentally survey all the courses that you've done and just ask about those connections because it's not as if you have this, connect, this course and this course and this course and they're all separate. Um, uh, there's vast connections between them. Uh, those connections get stronger and stronger. The, the further you study, on the one hand, life gets harder and harder and harder. When you're, when you're up till 11 o'clock doing another bloody Paganin assignment, um, uh, yeah, life's getting harder. But on the other hand, it's getting simpler because you start to see more profoundly uh, the connections uh, between um, various areas of, of your studies in physics, uh, engineering uh, and beyond. So I invite you and challenge you to think about uh, those connections. You know, what insights does this course give onto the problem of signal transmission in electrical engineering? Uh, what are the analogies between uh, Schrodinger wave mechanics and linear algebra in second year? Um, or what are the connections between, uh, I don't know, orthogonal function expansions in this context and orthogonal function expansions in some other context? Um, uh, where have you seen or where could you apply these um, means of applying differential equations in a different setting? Uh, um, uh, and, and, and so on. Now, I've just lost the thread, one second. Um, the Schrodinger equation isn't the only equation of quantum mechanics. Um, so we've met the Schrodinger equation. I seem to have lost the ability to write. It's because the chalk's too small. Um, at least I'm blaming the chalk. Uh, Schrodinger equation uh, is an equation of quantum mechanics. You've also seen uh, a modified form of the Schrodinger equation called the gross pitieski equation that we've mentioned at least twice previously. It's used to describe uh, turbulent quantum systems such as uh, Bose-Einstein condensates in one of the two uh, Bose-Einstein condensate laboratories at Monash and also um, the many dozens worldwide. The gross pitieski equation is also used to uh, solve uh, for the quantum liquid that is a neutron star. Exactly the same equation, kind of remarkable. Uh, those simulations that you saw in your first assignment um, are very, very, very similar sim simulations with quantum turbulence um, and, and vortices um, interacting in various ways are also used. Exactly the same equation for modelling a, a neutron star, except instead of being a disk, it's a sphere. Uh, there are relativistic versions of the Schrodinger equation. We've met one of them in the tutorial. This was the Klein-Gordon equation. And this is the relativistic equation used to describe spin zero particles and also spin uh, particles where spin can be ignored. That also begs the question about what is the correct... And, and so this is used every um, microsecond in the light, Large Hadron Collider where particles are intrinsically quantum mechanical and relativistic. Um, you also have a relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation for spin half particles. Uh, this is called the Dirac equation. Um, and there are also various modifications um, thereof, which I won't get into. Now these, these are describing matter, for example, example, electrons or other material particles. You also have the Maxwell equations of classical electrodynamics. Uh, this is matter fields. Well, these are radiation. Uh, such as electromagnetism. Uh, how do you write down a quantum theory of electrodynamics? Uh, it's called uh, quantum electrodynamics, or QED for short. Um, how do you get photons out of the Maxwell equation? That's a subject that we haven't uh, touched on. We've spoken of photons as billiard balls, and that's fine in the context, for example, of Compton scattering. But um, uh, to uh, take the structure of Maxwell theory and turn it into a quantum theory of electromagnetism uh, to get um, 
photons in that sense, is a subject that we haven't touched on uh, in this course. And there are so many things that we haven't touched on, but these things uh, are developed as uh, in many of the courses that you study in the future um, will apply some aspects of this to a greater or to a lesser extent. Again, I invite you to look back on previous courses and ask um, how does looking at those previous courses um, set up links between the things that you've learned, um, the things that you've learned here. Yep. And I do feel a little bit guilty. I do feel that this course is a little bit top heavy on formalism uh, and a little bit light on corresponding applications. Um, the reason I haven't done anything about it is because there's a lot of necessary formalism to learn in order to be able to meaningfully apply it to many other systems, such as statistical mechanics, in the next course of, of this lecture series. Uh, and having a firm basis in that is, is, is necessary. Uh, also, we did have quite a few applications, so I shouldn't be too guilty about that, but I do feel a little bit guilty. It may also have come as a little bit of a surprise how much time we spent on angular momentum. Uh, two points there. One is um, angular momentum is a surprisingly deep and difficult subject from the perspective of quantum mechanics. Uh, secondly, it's also really, really uh, important and, and, and broadly applicable. For example, if you were to um, find an arbitrary text in the library or on the internet on supersymmetry, one of the first things that they'll do will be to write down uh, commutation relations obeyed by certain uh, operators. And that idea of doing representation-free quantum mechanics, uh, taking nothing more than the algebra of emission operators and deriving a shocking amount of stuff from it, um, f is an example of this very, very powerful representation-free quantum mechanics. Uh, it's used in the theory of angular momentum here, the general theory. It's also used uh, much more generally, for example, in, in theories of supersymmetry. Uh, relativistic quantum mechanics and beyond. Any high energy particle physics text also will have an immense amount of stuff, a surprising amount of stuff on angular momentum. And that's one of the reasons that we spent so long uh, solving it. But even coming back to the Schrodinger equation, just because you know what the Schrodinger equation is, uh, there's still a myriad of applications to the Schrodinger equation. And again, viewing, bearing in mind that I valued the pure and the applied uh, equally, um, let me ask you a simple question. I know what the Schrodinger equation is. And I've got a lump of metal, I don't know, one by one by one centimetre cube of metal. This question seems boring, right? Um, here's a cube of metal, and I know what the Schrodinger equation is. I know what the density of the metal is, I know what its uh, resistance is, um, I, I know what colour it is, right? Um, question Solve the Schrodinger equation to get those material properties of that lump of metal. Simple lump of metal, crystal of copper, um, can't be done. Uh, that's a bit shocking, right? Some everyday thing. You know, how do you get first principles from the Schrodinger equation to the material properties of, of everyday uh, systems, such as a lump of copper? Now, huge progress has been made on this, and you can have a chain of approximations and computer simulations, which ultimately give you, get you almost there. But the problem of how to get from here to here in general, I mean, something simple like what's the crystalline structure of copper, predicted from first principles from the Schrodinger equation, uh, somewhat shockingly, still an open question. So there's vast amounts of open question, and just because you know the Schrodinger equation doesn't mean you know all its implications. And that's true of many laws of physics, and so you could spend a lifetime exploring uh, various solutions to the Schrodinger equation uh, in a variety of physics uh, scenarios. We were also very... Um, one particle centric. Yep. Most of our equations dealt with a single particle Schrodinger equation. And if you have an electron in a lump of metal, then your wave function is going to have the position for the first electron, the position for the second electron. Avogadro's number later, t, your Schrodinger equation is going to be kind of complicated. Um, and your potential term, you've got Avogadro's number of electrons. The potential is going to involve the separation of every single one of them. Uh, the Schrodinger equation for many body theory, many electrons, which occurs naturally in condensed matter, mundane systems such as lumps of cold metal, more exotic systems such as superfluids, um, which occur in uh, uh, liquid helium or in uh, neutron stars or quark stars. Many body theory, uh, we haven't really touched it much. Very, very interesting subject of theoretical condensed matter physics at honours level uh, and, and beyond. Um, one last thing I want to say is that, that I'm very much about looking beyond apparent complexity 
and yes, this is surgery, quantum mechanics and a bloody hard subject, but um, the idea of, of staring at things, of studying them, about thinking about them, uh, arguing about them until you can see a certain underlying simplicity, uh, I think is, is, is the key to understanding uh, quantum physics or management consulting or anything in between. Uh, never be faced by apparent complexity. Uh, always look for the simplicity that lies beyond. Uh, lastly, um, I've done my job if I make myself superfluous in the sense that you don't need me anymore uh, in order to further your learning. It's been a pleasure and thank you. Thank you. Um, U11 starts next week. He's a legend. <laughs>